Good afternoon and welcome to our, uh, our Basel Salon here on March 15th. We have uh, an interesting, hopefully, conversation for you. I will do it in a more free-flowing format, so please, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to raise your hand and we'll speak um, you know, to, to your concerns and questions. Uh, today we'll be talking about reaching out beyond the Caucasus. I have Suad Garieva next to me, who's the director of Yarat Foundation. Taz Machkeva, a wonderful artist who uh, will be traveling the world, I think, on various residencies. Um, we have Milas Garova of Gazelli Art House. And uh, I think what we'll do is just kind of get started and talk a little bit about each one of, our, of course, we have very interdisciplinary interests amongst us. Suad, of course, as the director of an institution in a very different setting. Um, I think we, what we were discussing is the difference of working in an institution in a place like Baku as opposed to a London or New York. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the... You have a nice view of Baku there in the background. Um, so um, I work for Yarat, a um, contemporary art organization, which is um, an organization that's been dedicated to promoting contemporary art in Azerbaijan, but also promoting art from Azerbaijan and the wider region in, in the world and um, internationally. And uh, this year is very exciting for us because we're opening our first contemporary art center in Baku on the shores of the Caspian as part of the bigger development. We're given um, a space and um, so we're opening with two shows. And, um, but what Ali, I want to talk about is um, creating an institution in Baku as opposed to somewhere like an international um, art city like London or New York is very different because we're dealing with very different audiences. So the works and the exhibitions that we bring in um, have to be, of course, um, at the forefront of international contemporary art and be very relevant internationally, but also be able to speak to the local audiences because the local audiences are not very well versed in uh, contemporary art discourse, let's say. And um, although they follow um, more and more um, the progress of international artists, exhibitions worldwide through social media and Instagram and Facebook and whatnot, but um, still what we get is um, people who are only getting to learn about contemporary art locally. So it's important to bring in art that can speak to them and educate them. And part of our big program is education because it's important to educate them before you can really expose them to something extremely radical so that we can attract also people to our institution. So considering audiences is a very big part of what we do. Do you say also as an artist that's something that you have to, you have to focus on and is that something that you embrace within your work? Um, educating audience. I mean, I think, uh, as Swat mentioned earlier, when we're having discussion about this panel, it's we have to avoid the patronizing. You know, we have to avoid not being the carrier of knowledge uh, to the sort of the uneducated, uh, so-called. And um, I mean, I moved back to, uh, after Miami about two years ago because I thought it's very important to be in the space and actually work with the local context and speak the local language. For example, the the work I made uh, recently, um, I became a superhero. Uh, now I'm not only Taos Makachev, I'm a super Taos. Um, and um, kind of, it's kind of daily activities that I perform that were very much inspired, for example, by work of a friend of mine, Sahrab Kashani, who's super Sahrab from Iran. So it's kind of these, uh, in one sense, useless uh, superheroes, um, but that sort of talk about various problems uh, that exist in the region. And for example, the work I made, it's a video with a video registrator, um, which is um, a very popular device in the region to sort of record what's going on outside your car, and which, is, which is going to be disseminated, not like an art video in, in sort of institutional context, but just as a video that you share on the internet or with your phone by WhatsApp and so on. Well, it's going to come up a bit later in my um, presentation. So I think um, it's, it's a fine line, but it's important to be in the space and it's important to think um, beyond the Caucasus, you know, uh, reaching uh, and um, sort of, I'm trying to sort of think what, 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 what is the perspective and who do we work for, you know, because um, I see the biggest problem is um, raising a new generation of artists, raising a new generation of artists, and of course Dagestan and um, Azerbaijan are super different because we are stuck with the post-Soviet sort of education system with the teaching um, faculty that was not renewed in like past 40 years, and of course the art that is produced locally is uh, to a different standard because a different conversation is going on, the same conversation that's been going on for a while. 
I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about the idea of what, you know, those influences could be for the next generation. One of the most important, you know, shows to have been, you know, curated and, and created of the 20th century was uh, the abstract expression of the show done by the American government and traveled uh, to Germany. And many artists now who are you know, considered the most, you know, important artists of their generation, like Baselitz, like, uh, like Richter, say that that show changed their lives. And it was that they could see what was possible, not in, you know, East Germany, not in, you know, post-war uh, Europe. And I think that what you've been talking about also, Mila, in the context of Gazelli, so a commercial gallery is bringing artists together, you know, obviously you're from Azerbaijan, but working with artists from Azerbaijan, but also working with international artists and trying to create that dialogue. Exactly, trying to get to create that dialogue, but I think it's also you know, like we've talked about it earlier just now, is the audience. It's who, you know, we've got a gallery out in London, we've got a gallery out in Baku. The shows, I try not to make them too different because you have to have some sort of, you know, some, some form of kind of consistency to tie the two spaces together. But, you know, regardless of that, you'd still, the presentation of it, the curation of it, the, also the educational program that, you know, ties in with the exhibitions that we do, it does have to adapt, and I think that's not only Azerbaijan, Dagestan, or any, um, you know, any country in the region. It's it's really any country has that kind of specificity, right, about the audiences from, you know, the collector's side, from the kind of commercial side, from the artist side. So you always have to, I think, be kind of um, responsive to that as the organizer or as you know, from a gallery's point of view. We do definitely have to have that kind of responsive um, uh, attitude, I guess, to to what we put on. But absolutely, that dialogue that you're talking about is extremely crucial to, to, to the gallery and to the program. Um, and we were also talking about kind of this idea of pigeonholing. Not pigeonholing, but I think it's for anyone, I mean, it's a human nature to kind of uh, pinpoint or, or, or have a certain, um, you know, description about a gallery or an artist uh, to tie them into a specific kind of um, society or a nation. This idea of national identity, I think, is crucial to understand you know, how the artists produce what they produce, how they kind of come across in the language that they're talking, you know, that they speak in. Um, and the, I guess the question what would be interesting to raise is how important are these national, or is this kind of national identity, how important is it to not play on it necessarily, but to, as we were saying earlier, Alia, to embrace it, right? Whether you're a gallery, an artist, a non-profit non organization, an institution. So maybe that's something mm -hmm. we could kind of address. I think, like you said, it's you know this idea of reaching out beyond the Caucasus. It's interesting that both of you have worked with Iranian artists, and this idea that there's a real dialogue, I think, between Iran and Baku, which is something I noticed, mm. and, and I think Shireen Nashat is your uh, show yeah, now. So no, we're opening with uh, Shireen Nashat's show, uh, curated by Dina Nasr Khadivi, uh, on the 23rd of March, and um, it's uh, again. I guess here it's not so much the Azerbaijan-Iran link, but it's um, more the fact that the links within the region do exist. But then again, they also don't save us from pigeonholing. But instead, I think what they are conducive to and where you need to embrace them is where you can make a difference in the region. And this is what we're trying to do with our permanent collection more than the exhibition program. And by focusing on uh, neighboring countries from the Caucasus, Central Asia, also Turkey, Iran, and Russia, um, we're trying to build a collection that will be uh, comprehensive for that region and that will be something that people can again relate to and um, also to support the local artists and to create an institution that collects their work which is something very unique to the region and has not been done before very much and um, whereas uh, speaking in terms of exhibiting art, the program we're pursuing is very much international. Yes, the first show is by Shirin Nishad because she is an Iranian artist who feels very connected to Azerbaijan. As so, so she, when we were with her last year yeah. on the trip that you, you had organized, she was so overcome by the celebration, the Nowruz no celebration. Rose, exactly. She said she hadn't seen it since she left Iran, you know, many, many yeah. decades ago. So it's a very personal thing for the artists, but this is exactly what we're also trying to pursue because the artists can come and, because we're commissioning a whole new body of work by Shireen, which is called The Home of My Eyes. And it's um, Yarat Commission as part of this exhibition. And this exhibition will be based on that commission. So here we're inviting the artists to react the way they want to react. So I think the connection here comes more through the artist's eyes. 
it's the, the, what she wants to pick. So in her case, she looked at the diversity in um, Azerbaijani faces from the people because there's so many interracial and uh, international, let's say, um, relationships that have been happening there throughout centuries. And this is manifested in people's faces, um, that they're all so different and also their life stories are so different. So this links back to Shirin Nashat's own work. And uh, I guess what we're trying to achieve is to create a platform where artists who come from um, all over the world and from com who come from very different practices can come and take what they will and expand on that. So be it geography, a culture, a tradition, music, uh, whatever they may. So in, in this case, we're leaving it open to them. House, in terms of your practice, would, what would you say your, your influences, of course, are very much about where you're from and your you know, connection to your heritage, to your family, but at the same time, you're pursuing an international arts education and various residencies and master's programs um, that, of course, are from, uh, let's say, more universal um, idea of practice. How do you balance that idea? Or do you find it difficult when you're back home? Um, well, it's been fine for now. For me, the sort of the marriage of success is the fact that I'm still married and my husband haven't abandoned me yet with uh, all the kind of all the traveling that I do. Um, but I'm actually I wanted to go back to sort of the um, national identity. And I think it's a kind of it's, it's and work that deals with sort of be it Azerbaijan, be it Dagestan, because it's it's a massive trap. You know, it's a massive trap that we're seeing outside these walls as well. You know, you can sort of uh, you can use it um, as a terrible uh, selling point, you know, as just kind of something that you have to pursue in order to be pigeonholed by an acquisition com com committee as sort of Middle Eastern art or art from the Caucasus. That's what we're discovering now, or Latin American art. Um, or you can use it as a field of research. I don't know, but some of my sort of favorite artists would be like Akram Zatari, Well Shauki, and so on. And kind of, um, and this is sort of a very fine balance that hopefully artists of the next generation would feel very well. Um, so kind of, yeah, this is just what sort of um, you, you mentioned. And I think um, if I talk about sort of the region right now, I mean, be it sort of post-Soviet, um, if, if I take Russia, because I am a holder of a Russian passport, um, it's kind of, there's a dichotomy. I mean, I think you saw in the images, um, there's, uh, I don't know, um, a Mercedes covered in Swarovski crystals that you can rent for a wedding. There are sort of cakes um, uh, made by local bakers with like Ro Rolex watch and Louis Vuitton and Chanel bags on one hand. And then there are these kind of strange post-Soviet mosaics and, you know, strange expansions of uh, city spaces and, and buildings. And um, I think we have to be situated somewhere in the middle, I suppose. Well, I mean, talking about uh, my specific context. I think the best example is my favorite place in the city. It's um, Yarakskava Street. And um, there's a shop um, called... Um, the the title is in English, Girl in Hijab, with a motto in Russian, just cover up. And then sort of there's a gap that I see. For me, it's a metaphorical gap. And then on the right, there's, um, there's a shop, uh, elite um, underwear from Europe, butterfly. You know, and then there's this gap because kind of we're pulled here, we're pulled kind of in this kind of new brand of Islam into the secular craziness in a way. But there's no, there's no sort of, there's no culture, there's no um, Dagestani culture that is developing and then can give the vision of the future. It's either this or that. And I think this is where art comes into picture. And this is where art can offer um, a, a good sort of um, uh, future with a critical reflection uh, that sort of masses can have. And if, if I may just continue this or, or ask you something in line with that, do you see it changing over the next kind of five to ten years and therefore reflect, will it be reflective in your practice? So today you have this incredible content to work with because of the nature, you know, of the natural state of the, of the place you come from. But if it were to change politically, socially, in every kind of aspect, would that, you know, severely kind of, I guess, influence your, your practice? Um, I mean, you, if, you mean if we separate from Russia and become an Islamic state, what would happen? No idea. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll be imprisoned. Um, no, not really. Um, I'm not, um, I don't know. Of course it's changing because for the past two years I moved uh, there and I started collecting these strange things like cakes, like old Soviet signs because for me they're sort of um, best monuments of sort of gone, um, gone time, gone politics and gone vision. A, a country had a vision, you know. Mm. Now we're just like this crazy, um, crazy boy in a cake shop that wants to bite everything, unfortunately. Um, so... 
I mean, of course it will change, of course, um, kind of if it separates, but I, I don't have the, any vision for the future. But I think the context is changing. I mean, um, I see other artists appearing that sort of speak um, the same language and ha having a good um, sense of sort of attentiveness to detail and to our everyday, be it political or just sort of um, social. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually, I was very interested in what you were saying because of course kind of it's, it's um, one can be an institution that promotes art from Azerbaijan, just from the region, but I, what I find uh, quite interesting about what you do, and we saw in the slides, is that it's a mix, you know. You're trying to kind of build in the art from the region into a wider world context. Exactly. I think, again, going back to this dialogue, it's, it, to me personally, what's interesting is how and one of the artists, for example, we work with, um, Mexican photographer, she went off, Alinka Echeverria, she went off to South Sudan during you know, the, the, the year of, of, of liberation and did a whole series of, of photographs of, you know, uh, which were focusing exactly on that region. So to me, what's interesting is how me from Azerbaijan can you know, exhibit a, in, in a gallery in London, a, a Mexican who has a series on South Sudan where she's done you know, a series dedicated to Cuba. So it's that kind of international dialogue, which I think um, it, it raises quite a, a, you know, quite kind of, interesting generally topics that that are universal that are applicable to or we can go back and draw this kind of cycle and it can go back to certain you know similar questions being raised in Azerbaijan and in uh, Dagestan but in that kind of international context um, you know so in line of what you were saying just another thing which I think is a question to both of you and to me and just something to consider is um, I'm going to mention another very famous exhibition like I did. Um, so 1989, Magicienne de la Terre. Um, of course, that was the exhibition that we all know very well that opened um, the boundaries of contemporary art or of art in general, showing that you can be, uh, you don't need to be Western-centric, you don't need to be from Europe or America to show art and that can, it still can have value and be very interesting. And I think quite a few years, decades, even now, later, uh, people still quote that. But I think what's interesting now is that, and what we also often see in the international fairs, um, from the nature of the works changing, depending on whether they're exhibited in Miami, uh, London, Basel, or Hong Kong, that it's almost become a um, trademark, that it's almost become something that artists and institutions want to preserve, um, something, some belonging to geography. On the one hand, you want to be considered as, something, as, as someone very international, but on the other hand, um, kind of being belonging to an exotic, let's say, geography, plays into your hands sometimes because people are attracted to this exoticism. People are, it differentiates you from the sort of homogeneity that's, um, you know, abounding everywhere. That's basically, we see everything is the same and then, oh, there's an artist from Dagestan who is, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm like, you know, and uh, who is uh, asking universal questions but um, still uh, using a very local vernacular to raise them, uh, showing that, you know, how we are all the same, we're people, but we do have our own uh, questions to ask depending on where we come from or maybe our own aesthetics or, you know, how do you feel that affects what you do. Is it a positive maybe? Or is it just, you know, this geographical things, belonging? I think it makes things more interesting. I mean, if, if we expected all artists around the world to have the same influences, I mean, that would be impossible. And I think that when, you know, you talk about, you know, these acquisitions committees, you know, Sir Nicholas Sirota is, is here and, and gave a, a speech yesterday. Um, for his international council and for many members of the Asia Pacific Acquisitions Committee that are here. And he was saying, you know, what we've been able to do is bring artists from around the world and not exhibit them as, here's a room of China, here's a room of Lebanon, here's a room of, of the Middle East in general. No, it's putting, you know, wonderful Japanese photography alongside wonderful American photography, English, you know, European. So it's not about making you know, rooms in, in, within an institution of different countries. It's about integrating things. Um, I actually, just to go back, because when Ali was saying, I actually was thought she was going to mention the Jan Ber Martin show, the Magician de la Terra. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, for me, that would be sort of a landmark. But then again, um, from that exhibition, from kind of what I um, recall reading, it's kind of, it's a lack of context that was sort of 
um, that um, sort of African artists were exhibited, I suppose, um, that was uh, problematic. Um, but um, I don't know, like, if I think about my practice, it's my interest in locality. You know, I've, I've spent like three years in, in, a, in an institution in the West, uh, just kind of having a conversation with the artists who died 20, 10, 15 years ago, you know, just like, oh, this is my response to, I don't know, years of boys, and this is my response to this. And I'm just not interested, you know, I'm interested kind of in, in field research, in sort of, um, in, in things that I find in, in my locality, in, in I don't know, um, manifestations of masculinity, of gestures that I find in Malikality. I mean, perhaps you saw it, there was a slide from the collection that I collect called um, Vocabulary, yeah, and it's about, you know, how you shake hands. You know, this is how you shake hands with someone you don't really care about, you know. This is someone you actually care about, and this is like big respect, you know, type of thing. You know, how, so these things that sort of trigger my interest. Of course, I sell better because I'm from Dagestan, you know, I'm making videos as well. God, I'm rich. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it answers um, your question. Yeah. Amelia, what's think, your take on, like, art, artists working within those practices? Like, how, I mean, would you, would you say that? For me, for me it's, it's just, the question has always been longevity. So, if, for me, if an artist is very kind of, um, let's say, responsive to where they come from and this is all they do, then that raises some red flags, to be honest, because that, you know, after that region or that area or that country becomes not popular necessarily, but once that novelty about that country goes, and it will go sooner or later, because there'll be another country, there'll be another region that everyone would be. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm wait, wait, for it, it wait, wait. I'm not criticizing. For this to I'm not um, very regular. No, but occurs. but you know what I mean. It's kind of um, it's it's I I guess uh, not not necessarily to do with Azerbaijan or Dagestan. Generally, when I think a new country enters this kind of dialogue of or or the the international art, what do you call it, industry? Let's say right a new market comes about, you, of course, would have that whole kind of audience, the whole international audience. I mean, for example, even this talk, it wouldn't probably be happening, you know, say, a few years back, because that, the, the idea of Caucasus, of Central Asia, of, of generally kind of that region, wasn't really on, on the map for whatever reason. And uh, I mean, to, just to interrupt you slightly on that, I would say that it's, from my experiences of what, working in the Middle East, it's not necessarily that it's not on the radar, it's that people don't get asked. I mean, the reason we're doing this talk is not because our Basel said, let's do a talk about the Caucasus. It actually came from personal connections and requests saying, we would really like to talk about this. You know, is there a place for us to do it? And exactly. So it came from... But both ways, the demand to the room is full. The demand is, is, is there as well. The interest, rather, is there. So it, it works both ways, I think. Of course, if, if back in Azerbaijan, if things weren't as actively developing as far as the art goes as it is now, it wouldn't, it, you know, it, it wouldn't be a discussion or, or, again, a conversation point outside or, again, on the international kind of scene. So it's, the, the point is that the, the, I guess it's, again, a question of longevity. Going back to, to artists or, um, you know, the artistic kind of, uh, not credibility, that's not the right word, but longevity, right? It's if, it, as Suad said earlier, if, if an artist raises certain universal questions, which will be applicable and continuously discussed in 10, 20 years down the line, whichever these questions are, if they raise them within this kind of framework, I guess, they're th within the mindset that they have due to where they're from, that's absolutely, that's fine, because that's who you are. You are where you come from, that, you know, you embrace that, you, it, that the, it is an obvious thing. If, what I guess is from a commercial point of view, when you see quite evidently artists specifically um, uh, kind of focusing on, on, on a national trait or a national kind of aspect, right, that because just to catch this ride of, or, or catch this wave of interest to their country, that is something I think is quite dangerous because today you're known for it, you're kind of, you as an, as an artist, you're known for it, you're, you're, you know, being talked about and tomorrow you'll be sadly forgotten because tomorrow will be some, some other country taking the center stage of that same interest, you see? Um, I think it's very important um, w what you mentioned and uh, it is a risk, but I think that's how you can tell sort of um, the art that can speak to everyone and that is in line with um, kind of 
international discourse because uh, uh, you know the world is such that we are all going through very similar experiences nowadays regardless of where we are if we are exposed to the basic things such as the internet so uh, we are already exposed to many um, uh, you know visual and uh, literary uh, influences um, that people and artists uh, as people also, <laughs> exactly, as, a, as a one category of that, that, that category species, people. Uh, respond to, you know, so, um, and I think depending on how um, you also perceive the work, so for example, um, uh, do we run a risk by collecting art from a particular region? Um, I don't view it that way because I think the artists that are in the collection, they are okay, they might be um, Turkish or Dagestani or Iranian or Kazakh, but um, the world is such that many of these artists now work all over the place, live all over the world. They do residencies everywhere and they're always in continuous contact with, an inter with their international colleagues. So I think uh, the influences, they go back and forth. And, um, and I think it's great because we're opening borders. But what's also important is to not... Well, two things. One is to provide uh, support from artists from the region. But the other thing is, again, going back to the audiences because the audiences... Um, uh, like the art that speaks to them directly because it's not easy to relate to things um, that are completely outlandish um, and if a person has not, is not well versed in contemporary art. So I think it's also important to have that intimacy with your local audience and not just the international audience. And um, again, that goes back to what you said earlier about, uh, the, say, the Doha experience or, you know, building museums and crowding it with um, international contemporary art that has nothing to do with the local, uh, doesn't have any local reference at all. Was it important for you to commission a work alongside doing a show with, with Shireen? Um, I, well, that's part of our um, program is that uh, the temporary exhibition program will be very much based on commissions, um, which partly which is how they're going to also enter the collection because when you commission an artist, be it Iranian, American, um, German, whoever, uh, regardless of their nationality, if you're commissioning a work, um, because it's an institution based in Baku, for a center based in Baku, um, we're hoping that the work will, in one way or another, relate to their uh, local geography, to, uh, to the center, and this is how also the work will go back into the collection and be preserved. But so then, especially in this case, it seems also rather important because of course Shireen, her work is additioned. Will the other additions will then hopefully enter collections around the Absolutely. world. And then it's always, you know, you walk into somebody's home and it'll be a Shireen Neshat. Oh, but this was a Shireen Neshat commissioned mm -hmm. by uh, well, I think Yara. it's not so much the ownership thing to say, oh, it's commissioned by art. No, but the fact that Shirin Nishat made this series about Azerbaijani people was our contribution because exactly, it will circulate, hopefully, and uh, online or physically, um, and people will get to know. And this also raises immense awareness of, you know, through contemporary art, of the culture of Azerbaijan through the eyes of a completely foreign artist in this case. So, um, again, without being too nationalistic, it's not prescriptive, but, you know, we'll see how it develops and um, how somebody else might react. For example, our next show um, is a group show um, on digital art. I can't disclose too much because it, uh, you know, hasn't been agreed exactly the title or anything yet, but it's on digital art with mostly American artists, young American artists. So exactly the things that they might find interesting, it can be something um, very completely different, it will, most likely will be. Taos, so. I think you were just about to say. Uh, no, I'm just thinking, oh my God, I wish we had that much money. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking kind of about uh, the whole structure that we're faced in, in Russia where, you know, um, you know, U.S., they don't have ministries of culture. You know, they, they have like, I don't know, 20,000 foundations that supports culture and we have ministry of culture and um, I suppose people that uh, occupy it don't, um, don't see uh, the actual sort of real path of uh, developing. I mean, otherwise we would have kind of similar program, I suppose, in a way. Um, and it wasn't always that way. I mean, of course, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, 50, 50 years ago it was all relevant. Yeah. It was all relevant and competed with um, uh, Jackson Pollock. <laughs> well, exactly. I, suppose, yeah. I mean, that, was, that show was exactly for that moment. And I think that maybe, may, maybe because, you know, you can't always have, I think, this omnipotent government structure, but obviously you want a conducive environment. I mean, in the United States, 
yeah. you know, there's no there's no minister of culture either. Yeah, yeah. But I would just wonder uh, about visibility and invisibility because it was uh, it was really amazing uh, to, for me to see a year ago the Eduard Puterbrod exhibition at the Charge Art Foundation. Um, it's, he's a Dagestani artist that was uh, sort of um, unfortunately killed during a, a robbery, and he's for me like he's a wonderful artist. And you know, and it was completely like he's completely invisible from this center, that center, and, and all the other possible centers. And I, um, I, I j I'm just kind of, my worry is that uh, we always think about uh, sort of this Eurocentric perspective, we always think about the West uh, in order to feel alive, in order to be recognized. You know, if I'm recognized from the left, that means I'm, oh, yeah, from the left, uh, that means I, I exist. And yeah, so I don't know uh, if you can respond to this <laughs> you somehow. Said, you said we, you mean we who? Um, from, I don't know. Maybe from yeah, the, if we take the emerging world. Am I right? Is that, is that a valid worry that I have? In terms of being uh, perceived in a certain way by no, the it, West? Just in terms or of even being seen. Being yeah. seen, you know. Like you, that you're, you, from you, one you need point. to have like a Western affirmation. Right. In order to What's really interesting is actually, in, well, in a slight preparation for this talk, I was thinking about how it was during the Soviet times, right, even in Baku. So the artists, and we had a great you know, art scene still back then, the art scene um, or the artists in Baku, their kind of uh, their benchmark, so to speak, their aspired level was a Russian artist, right? Was was the, the Moscow was as the Moscow, center. right? Moscow was the center. They wouldn't, they didn't know probably what was not no, but perhaps the yeah, the the curiosity didn't go as far as U.S. or as far as the West generally. It was Moscow was it. And what's interesting is that they often the ones that did get you know noticed and recognized even locally, both in Baku immediately in Azerbaijan and in Russia or the, or the Soviet Union, was their, their affiliation with the political party. So this kind of, you know, this, this idea of your choice as a, um, well, where you stand kind of in, in a political way was crucial, as uh, talent obviously aside. So it, it's incredible what you're saying now, because I guess the mentality is still with us, the mentality of kind of the West or, or the formation of, of, you know, I guess U.S. Or, or I don't know what the West really is, to be honest. You know, we can go into this whole detail of define the West, geographical borders and all the rest of it. But I think, I think it's, it's more to do with perhaps, again, going back to this international art scene. And it's easier, at least for me, to view the whole thing from the gallery's point of view, from anyone's, you know, you can put yourself in the shoes of an artist as much as you can, or in a collector's point of view, it's much, it, it becomes much easier to uh, view things in an independent kind of way, in an unbiased way, when you look at it kind of on an international art scene type of, uh, you know, art stage rather type of way, rather than them and us, you know, it, it's what's happening here, it's, it's how do we, do you see what I mean? That's that's kind of this this flexibility and this borderless is what is what you know is, is for instance the, my interest. It's also really interesting though to to almost map a country in its own development, talking about it in relation to other countries, maybe not the West, but other countries in their region or other countries with whom they have like a power a power structure, a power network. The Malevich show at the Tate, for instance, was really it was obviously very much about the work of Malevich, but it was very much about the history of Russia, you know, through his work as an artist and where he could work and where he couldn't, what he did at this moment and the organizations he was involved with. So it was almost using art history to discuss a very political situation. Uh, what's also curious is that how long it took for Malevich exhibition to actually happen at Tate, because, you know, being uh, an extremely influential figure in art history, regardless of geography, you know, um, it only, said, it instance, only happened. If the no. hotel, if the hotel, if the, if, if, well, no, because there was a, one of the last sections was, there was a discussion about, you know, this idea of living and, you know, moving from residency to hotel, uh, but that if the Tate and, you know, the UK government, if they had wanted to do the show now, it probably wouldn't be able to happen. So, you know, I think that it's... No, it's true. It's just curious because I think, again, it goes back to answer Mila's question, is I think right now you have a, a sort of a borderless uh, situation where, you know, there's pretty much free flow of 
persons and goods and art and information um, uh, unless you are in a very remote area and I think the region we're discussing is becoming less remote whereas in the Soviet times it was kind of another world it was almost like going to the moon at one point so I think now everyone is very much integrated and um, an idea of the West exactly has changed you know we're now in Hong Kong having this conversation and that's East you know and uh, so I think that's an interesting discussion also because borders uh, uh, get removed and also art centers shift and I think part of the reason of um, creating institutions, creating biennials and even having international fairs is to shift this view a little bit and to create centers that can compete and that can have their own voice um, on this sort of uh, circuit and in this uh, global dialogue and I think that's very important that it's happening now to this extent. As in terms of your education, were there certain places I mean, certain geographical locations, not necessarily an institution, or was it very much about the institution? For instance, you said you're going to Delphina Foundation, you're gonna be in Maastricht. I mean, was it very important for you to be in London um, particularly, or was it more about the actual organization? Uh, it was actually, uh, well, uh, yeah, I have to, d full disclosure. Um, my first degree is in economics, but I kind of successfully escaped uh, into um, contemporary art, and uh, my BA is, is at Goldsmith, and uh, then I went back to Russia for four years, and then it was MA at RCA. So, of course, kind of, I, I've been formed, and even this sort of self-criticality and, and the, these multiplicity of voices that I hear is, uh, has been very much given to me by, this, by the education um, that I have. So kind of this is part of the reason I'm here, you know, and I'm not sure that I kind of believe in this borderless um, thing that you're talking about because, I mean, I'm here because um, Art Basel Salon had the funds to fly me here, you know. Otherwise, I would have been kind of together with my colleagues um, in, in, in Dagestan, or perhaps teaching there. You know, I'm, I'm here because somebody has funding, you know, some, somebody not there on one, on one occasion. Um, yeah, so, um, but then your studies, I mean, presumably, and I don't know if that's appropriate to ask, oh, but I might as well it. go for it. Um, presumably it was what a scholarship that you, that you got or... No, I sold a kidney. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, actually, I, like, I had some inheritance that I spent. I no, didn't I mean, get any scholarship. But, but the thing is, so this, this idea of financing funding, I guess, that's important as well, right? But what the, the idea of, again, going back to this idea of borders and borderless, um, societies, markets, what, however you want to, uh, you know, word it. Um, it's, I wonder if your art, for example, would have been extremely different or slightly different or not different at all if you were to get educated somewhere else in Moscow. Absolutely, or absolutely. In what um, way? Um, <laughs> I'll be painting. I'll be painting still lives. Well, I mean, like, especially if I was educated in Dagestan, because I, I teach um, there at the local art school, like, once a year, kind of, I have this course on performance art, and I kind of see um, eyes that are curious, but they are complete that sort of for them history of art actually ends with Jackson Pollock, unfortunately. Exactly because, I, I, as I was saying, it's kind of it's a Soviet model of education that was never re re renewed, you know, and reviewed in the same as the ministries of culture politics. So it would have been uh, totally different. That's why I can't be kind of super uh, critical. Um, I disagree again with you. Uh, why? And it's funny because um, uh, going back to borderlessness, I didn't necessarily mean uh, physical um, transportation. Um, but also, and I, what I also disagree with is that you particularly would have still been painting if you were educated in Moscow and never left to go and study in the UK. Because I think as an extremely curious individual, you would have already learned that there are many other things and you could have as many artists do, in fact, in Russia and Azerbaijan and um, everywhere else, uh, with enough access to, again, a, com a computer screen and a decent connection, can already, can already learn quite a lot about what's going on and what is possible. And I think you would have been exactly one of those people. And um, we have quite a few examples of people like that in Baku who have never been educated abroad. And, you know, and yes, they didn't have a chance to um, travel until recently. And then, you know, um, recently there has been much more support and uh, a big part of it coming again from Yarat in Azerbaijan, but maybe some other organizations or patrons somewhere else, elsewhere. But uh, only in the past three years, they have been able to really go abroad Broad and exhibit at international platforms um, and this gave them a lot but their work formed locally and yet it is still very interesting to international audiences um, so 
there's also that side of the coin. It's not necessary to have an international education to be a relevant artist outside of your own geography, I think. Uh, perhaps, but I, I just want to ask you um, that do you know, uh, when you look at the artists that you work with, when it's a mimicry and, then, and when it's a language? You know, when they mimic and when they actually speak? Um, I think uh, this is a problem of uh, art in general and that um, it doesn't have to do with geography. And I love this topic and we often discuss this with you. Um, um, yeah, as some of you may not know, but we've worked on many occasions before, so this is actually becoming very interesting right now. But, uh, you know, I think it's regardless of geography. You have that happening in London when artists mimic, and in New York, and everywhere else. And this is exactly what I meant when I was speaking about homogeneity, when everyone mimics everything. And is there even a language now where everything is just recapturing and reinterpreting material that's already been produced before? So that's um, already a completely different discourse. As, as opposed to inventing your own language. So, and in fact, I do think that artists from these interesting geographies, and I don't mean just the Caucasus or Central Asia, I mean internationally, when they come to international platforms such as this, or be it a Tate or MoMA or wherever, um, their voice is understood as a very particular language. Whereas a local artist from New York could be seen as mimicking somebody else and, you know, recapturing just material, reinterpreting, re re repeating something that's already been said. Whereas artists from Dagestan or Baku or Tbilisi could be seen as saying something new. And I guess there's, a, there's two sides of this coin as well. But for us, I think it goes back to the fact that when you grow up there, you kind of want this new education. And we have the same problem as you do in Baku, that art education is very much outdated. And it's very important to invest in that so that artists young artists can really see, can have a different benchmark altogether as opposed to what they had 50 years ago. Um, so yes, it is a problem, but then there are ways, you know, and I'm, I, I don't know, I'm hopeful. I actually have a question for Aliyah, since we kind of pushed her out of the discussion. <laughs> That's my job here is to let this I, happen. I know you're somewhere there, you know, in the upper, on the upper level. If there's like middle world, low world, and the upper world, you're there. So um, I want to ask you actually, who creates the interest? You know, who creates the interest in Middle Eastern art, Caucasus? How does it happen? I mean, I think, touching back to a point earlier, the way in which this talk happened, it, you know, comes... It comes from there, I think, you know, and I think very much in the way of what's happening in the Middle East now, you see, you know, people making a concerted effort to create things there that have interest for the local community, as well as bring an international audience. And I think it's been incredibly important in the Middle East that there is that dialogue. It's, of course, about education. It's, of, of course, about just having a presence of contemporary art in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Doha, in Saudi. Um, and of course, across the region, that's like a very Gulf-centric statement, so I'm sure I'm gonna get some problems for that. But I mean, you know, Lebanon has been, a, a, you know, really at the forefront of so much of what's happened, and especially in terms of artists. Um, and now slowly, slowly, you know, building in institutions that have an international presence. And I think when you see that, that's where it becomes really interesting. It, there's a, obviously locals who are really out there promoting what they're doing. You know, you have Athar Gallery here, from Jeddah, and they make a very concerted effort to be a gallery, you know, for Saudi artists in the West, and also having an international program in Jeddah so that the locals can see art from elsewhere. And, and I think it, it needs to come from there. You know, can't just be all of a sudden one day somebody wakes up in London or New York and says, oh, I wanna, I wanna go look at Middle Eastern art. But I think that when you have really interested art collectors and museum directors, if they're traveling somewhere you know, what's the first thing most of us would do? You go to the local museum. So, you know, you have a big collector from New York or London or, you know, Los Angeles traveling to Cairo. Well, they're going to go to the National Museum. But if you're somebody who's interested in contemporary art, you also want to see, oh, isn't there a contemporary art museum? Oh, no contemporary art museum? That's strange. What about a space? What about a gallery? So it also very much has to be provided for in the local context. And I think, you know, having places like Art Basel in Hong Kong, you know, Miami. I mean, you look at the transformation in Miami. It's shocking, you know, in the, in the last 10 years of having, you know, contemporary art museums that are collecting and supporting their local communities and have had a serious economic impact.
forget about even the art aspect of it if, if you want. But, you know, people have a better quality of life because of the presence of a major arts institution. Is it time to bring Art Basel to the Caucasus, you think? <laughs> I think we can all benefit. No, it's Yarat, Yarat is, is doing a pretty good job. Gazelli, you know, you have this organic creation. I mean, for you with Gazelli, do you see when, when you have international artists coming to Baku, do you, you try to create a dialogue with local students and the local community. I mean, I think that's probably something that Shireen is really interested in and, and something that your artists are too. Yeah, I mean, going back to what you were saying, Suad, in terms of having the artists, the invited artists, to interact with the local audience, to interact with generally the, the scene, so to speak, of the country, it happens organically, naturally from them. So we, we are the platform and, and the artists would go out there and come up with the projects themselves. Oh, how great it would be to, you know, come back next year or come back in a few months' time, because they genuinely get inspired. And I understand that whole kind of process, because it's, again, this, they haven't been, you know, many of them haven't been to Baku before. So it's kind of, it, it, is, it, it's, it, it is crucial to have that kind of infrastructure in place, whether there is a, a, a kind of a, a, not point, but a, an intention of actively promoting the local cultural scene, or, or whether it's an independent stand that you take, whichever way you go, that the galleries, the more galleries there are out there, the more, you know, again, non-profits there are. It's, it, as you were saying, Taos, as well, it's, it, it, it's it, the, the, the education element of it. These are the steps, I think, that any, you know, again, younger, uh, I guess, art market scene, art, you know, emerging uh, art scene should, should follow, I guess. It's, it's, yeah, it's what happens in practice. It's how do you not only invest you know, if there are funds, how do you invest into that structure, but also maintain it? You know, also make sure that, again, this connection with the local audience is there. Not only do you provide and start inviting all the artists that you can think of, all the kind of, you know, that the top 10 artists that are rated quite high up uh, in the world internationally, start inviting them and, and, and do something, but it's about kind of really, you know, going or trickling down into, into you know, on all, on all kinds of levels, I guess, socially and in every kind of aspect, right? Um, I think one of the things that uh, we've tried to do at Yarat as well is, um, um, apart from um, a very uh, big um, commitment to our educational programs, to bringing people specifically for lectures and master classes, I think what's also important is to uh, capitalize on the opportunity of when uh, an international artist or um, uh, an artist from a neighboring region comes in and does a show to also uh, get them to speak, get them to meet with young artist students and get them to speak to what they do best. Like Tawis mentioned, she had a talk. Um, or a series, was it one talk? Yeah, I, I, I can't yeah, yeah, it was one. Yeah, exactly. So it's a talk, um, a lecture or a seminar, or uh, some people even stay longer and they do, you know, a week or two week long workshops. And it's also important, it's kind of peer to peer, kind of, it's an artist to artist dialogue. Um, which, um, of course, is not going to replace an uh, art academy um, or, uh, you know, completely revolutionize it, but uh, at, th at least it can contribute. And I think that's very important because um, we get uh, bigger and bigger attendance numbers at those events and people go away uh, or artists go away making a new video work or a series of photographs and they get inspired and uh, also to do their further research on their own and to develop their practice accordingly. So I think that's also very important and, um, you know, step by step, I think, we'll hopefully break some boundaries. Uh, maybe, maybe it's, uh, yeah, um, I just wanted, uh, I just have one quote in my mind that was uh, on a medal um, um, that was sort of distributed during time of the Caucasian War when Dagestan became part of Russia um, from like about 80, uh, 80, 1860. And um, the quote on this military medal says, those who think about consequences are not heroes. On that happy note, uh, I believe we have a question from the audience. Um. Just a, a brief question about the regional. I just wondered how Yarat deals with the regional <coughs> um, <coughs> insofar as you know, distinct from government policy. I mean, for example, Armenia. Uh, what's the... what? 
degree of fostering and exchange is there with a country like Armenia? Um, well, unfortunately, um, some politics, they, uh, you know, they do not let us cross borders that are not crossable. And, um, but this also has a lot to do, again, with the local audiences. And because we put our audiences first, and the audiences are very sensitive to this topic, and because um, with any conflict, I do not think that um, art could be understood in the correct way locally. So on international platforms, it's very well to do it. And we have done shows. I personally have curated shows previously I, um, uh, of art from the Caucasus in Central Asia. And of course, Armenian artists were included in that. But that was on a platform in London. It was at Sotheby's. But, um, you know, and, but having Armenian artists present in a show in Baku you know, outspoken Armenian artists and Sean Baku would never be welcomed by local audiences and this is not something we want to, uh, you know, we don't want to upset our audiences in that particular regard because we're very well aware of the situation, you know. So it's, um, it is a sensitive issue but it is there unfortunately. And it's not something we but can solve. There's nothing you can do? Uh, unfortunately not in the local format, no. There's nothing yeah. we can do and, um, and but perhaps, in, yeah, exactly. But it's not, it's something beyond our uh, modest reach. Thank you. Um, I would agree with uh, what Aliyah said that uh, supporting contemporary art uh, really contributes to the development of the region. Because, for example, we are going for the first time to Baku <laughs> end of March for the opening of Yarat's uh, contemporary art space. And um, I would like to ask Soad, um, Azerbaijan is quite active internationally uh, in terms of uh, contemporary art. What do you think about other post-Soviet countries like uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Georgia, etc., Armenia, okay, Uzbekistan, let's take for example. What do you think about their presence uh, on the international art scene? Um, I think that, uh, yes, Azerbaijan has been probably one of the most active amongst them. And, um, but also from other countries, you know, uh, we work a lot with um, artists from all over, the, all over that sort of Central Asia, Caucasus region that you mentioned. But I think there are more and more galleries being set up in Kazakhstan. And there are more and more uh, artists from Central Asia being represented by international galleries. And I think even uh, before I start looking at this region already, many of um, international names, uh, many of the local names have become very much international through uh, their exposure to um, the art world in the West, let's say. They're represented by galleries, they show at museums, they do screenings if they're vi uh, into video and all that. So I think there's also a development going there, albeit maybe a little bit uh, less rapid than in Baku, let's say. But this is also why we're trying to make Baku a center for art from across the region. But then, you know, you have Taos with a center now in Mahachkala. No center. Oh, fine. But, you know, there's still shows and there are uh, lots of artist initiatives. Uh, there's a Biennale in Bishkek every two years that brings artists from all over the region there. That's actually has very cutting edge work. And um, there's, there's in terms of collect things, yeah. collectors in Baku, or even for you, Taos, who, the most people that collect your work are from where? Is it more local or? Uh, no? no, actually, no. I, although recently my work was bought by the Dagestani Museum of Fine Art, but it's because my aunt is a director of the museum. I think it's all <laughs> like, it's, it's quid for, for, for pro quo, you know, yeah. just um, in the region. Yeah, everything is in, in, within my reach. Um, yeah, so, but it's mostly outside, even outside Russia, because it's video, so it's kind of, it's, it's usually institutions. We have a work of those in our country. Oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, quid pro quo as well, like, being originally uh, from the country. I think this Caucasus is a good question to ask Mila, because she is the one. In terms of, well, I think that you all, we, as we discussed before, I mean, you made a, a very concerted effort to, to work inter with international collectors and international audiences for your galleries. So, you know, did you, of course, you started off with more interest, you think, from you know, your local community from, you know, various friends and family and, you know. In, out in London? Yeah. Out in London, it's been very much kind of European and American uh, driven. But because the gallery started off in Baku back in 2003, back then it was very much of a local initiative, locally supported, local artists shown. So it was a local thing. Nowadays, you know, fast forward 12 years or 13 years, however long past already, um, it is 
slowly and gradually you do get quite a mixed, we are getting quite a mixed kind of collector base that it does incorporate and bring, bring in the region, our, our part of the world kind of thing. So from Azerbaijan, from, you know, whether it's Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, so that these countries definitely, you know, or at least we have, you know, come across collectors from there, absolutely. But started off in London, yeah, very much uh, European and US based. Do you have any any further questions? Oh. Uh, as a as a as a owner of Contemporary Art Gallery from Moscow, uh, I have a quite obvious question. How do you girls see, um, uh, let's say, uh, integration of Russian art contemporary artists into the scene, taking into consideration the situation which is going on right now? I think this is a this is the political situation that we can deal with very easily. Um, I think um, because um, you know, artists from Russia they all speak. They still are very much connected to the whole um, discourse that's coming out of the region as a whole, and uh, you know, by the commonality of history, language, literature, and what else not. So I think there is a direct relationship there. So, for example, as far as we're concerned, it is part of our radar for our collecting. Uh, collection as well and um, but of course it depends on the artist I, I don't think these kind of national borders matter so much because that political situation also I guess is not as close home in our particular case um, I mean um, I have a, a different type of response because I think for me it fits in how easy and how hard it is to work in when you're in Russia these days. And I find it, found it much harder to speak when I was in Moscow because I get, you get involved in sort of an immediate politics. And this is why kind of the move to Dagestan is kind of so essential to me because I can talk about kind of poli policy politics on a different level. Like I just give you an example. You saw probably a slide. There was a, um, a cake of uh, Caspian Sea and the region that I made. And I also have another cake that I made uh, in, the, in the autumn, which was of Russia. Um, so it's a year ago, but the map was circa 2013 with no Crimea. So it's kind of, uh, I mean, it, it got misread in a really weird way because there was one review that said uh, uh, Russian oligarchs at a closed party hosted by Natalia Vadyanova ate a cake of Russia, which I think is fascinating, this reason, I mean, this reading, I mean. Um, and uh, I actually have a friend now from Ministry of Finance of Russia, and when I show him this work, I was, they were like, oh my God, you're going to be put in prison soon. But still, I mean, I don't, I think it's, I think people kind of still create, and it has no, Im I don't think it has impact. It has impact uh, because it's a bit harder to sort of, to speak, but then I think it might produce uh, more sort of, painful and valuable works. Just one last question. This gentleman has been waiting. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit about the conditions of practice for artists in Caucasia. Um, and I ask because um, I think in much of um, the Western world, um, contemporary art is only really notionally and avant-garde not really, it's just sort of notionally, because the development of art is somehow caught between uh, the market and the state. It doesn't exist as a sort of autonomous thing. And so I'd be interested to hear if, if, if an avant-garde exists there. Did it exist? Or, and and, do, and do, do you see the sort of development of art also moving towards a sort of neoliberal model? Yeah, Taz, do you want to... Yeah, I think I think we kind of live in the avant-garde actually in Dagestan, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, praise the avant-garde. Um, so um, it's because it's it's very much there are kind of no institutions, there's no <laughs> no support. You just sort of get your studio, and sometimes you get involved. I don't know in, in the theater productions, which were which were quite popular and still quite popular, and is a way of uh, surviving. So um, yeah, I would say um, I, I would I would say sort of absolutely, we're sort of in this. Uh, um, we exist in this uh, kind of pure, pure notion of, of, of art uh, production and this kind of uh, secluded um, uh, studio, um, studio art production in a way. I don't know if that sort of um, answers your questions, but perhaps. Uh, um, uh, regarding more historical avant-garde from the region, 1960s is a good, um, you know, there's a generation of the 60s. Um, that you can look up and that's when the real avant-garde happened I think then um, in the region as well as in Russia because they were against the social surrealism uh, dogmatism so um, I think that's when the most bright stars of avant-garde which now became sort of household names 
um, happened, less so maybe now. And uh, we're happy to answer some questions after, I think, in the transition to the next talk. But thank you so much for all being here.